All righty. Welcome this week on The Big Show. As we bring the year to a close, we look back at the worst or most disappointing movies of 2022. That's for you, Wilson. Over the course of the next hour, we'll share our list and discuss this year's choices. Plus, we have several new releases, including The Best Man, The Final Chapters, and Whitney Houston, I Want to Dance with Somebody. We'll have all that and more on episode 519 of Keeping It Real with Film Gordon. Let's go. Uh all right, and welcome to the latest episode of Keeping It Real with Film Gordon. I am Tim Gordon, and I am joined as we close the year. I like this. I'm joined, of course, by Charles Kirkland Jr. Charles, how are you? I am doing pretty good. Better than most, not as great as some. And look who's back, Wilson Morales. We talk about Wilson all the time. Wilson is always out chasing the story, doing what he's doing. Wilson joins us tonight for uh, this special episode of our show. Wilson, welcome, brother. How you doing? Well, I'm about look who's back. I guess uh, I wasn't. <laughs> as, it's hard to be back if you're not invited, you know. But <laughs> Charles, shots fired, man. Already, man. What's going on? All right, Wilson, off the break. Off the break, yeah, man. So, hey, bro. Like I said, man. When I say guess who's back, it's like. Wilson, Wilson, you have an open invite, man. I mean, I'm just saying this on air for everybody to know. I know you're busy, bro. That's why I don't reach out to you all the time. You got an open invite, man. You are you are a part of this show. So when you're not here, Charles and I are trying to hold it down because we don't have the expertise of Black Film and Television.com's Wilson Morales. We just don't. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> It's all good. <laughs> I'm playing nice. You Wilson six shots. I don't have any shots. I'm in the holiday spirit, man. <laughs> so Wilson, um, technically, man, uh, as we talk now, man, our film year, for all intents and purposes, man, it's probably over, man. I mean, there are no more films for us to screen in 2022. Um, I'm not sure if there are any junket opportunities that still exist in 2022. Am I wrong or right? No, at this point right now, between Christmas and New Year's, it's a wrap. All right, man. So, um, you know, even before we get to where we need to go, because that's coming up a little later on, we're going to go over uh, this list of the, I call them the worst. Wilson likes to call them the most disappointing. We'll talk about that. What are your impressions, Wilson? And I'll start with you on 2022 at the movies overall. You know, every year we get movies, you know, so you can't be looking, you know, is it going to be better than the previous year? Who knows? You know, you got to remember some movies were held back because of COVID. Some movies were restricted because of COVID. You're getting what you get, you know. Um, obviously, there are films that, that kept theaters alive, like Top Gun, and told everybody that we can do this, you know. But at the same time, because of COVID, well, I won't say because of COVID. Since COVID, and we were all stuck at home, there's been an explosion of streaming sites. So which means that there are a lot more product out there for us to watch at home, which made it easier not to go to the movie theaters. And so when you got used to a year watching movies on a 50, 60 inch TV, you're gonna, and you know, money is tight for some people, you're gonna be picky as to what you're going to see. It's gotta be worthwhile for you to see it in the theaters as opposed to saying, I'm going to wait for it at home. Some movies would come out, and like in the case of Warner Brothers, after 45 days, it's hitting the streaming service. Same thing for Universal. You know, you had a movie that uh, Jennifer Lopez did, Marry Me, three weeks later, it's on Peacock. Batman came out for a month later, it's on uh, HBO Max. So you have to decide if you're thirsty to see that movie, you'll go to the theaters. If not, you can wait to see it at home. And for movies... And for this particular section, when you're saying worst movies, you're going to be picky as far as what you see. You know, it's like, that's why I say if you're going to go see it and you didn't like it, then you could say you were disappointed in it. All righty. Well, I, I love that answer, man. And it's so interesting, the timing of it, because I was going to go straight to Charles and then Charles disappeared. So <laughs> while we're waiting on Charles Wilson, one of the things that I love and that I miss about what you do is... um. Every week, man, you know, or I'll, I'll, I'll just say every day, you have news that's very interesting about what's going on in our industry and black entertainment, man. So can you break down uh, what's interesting this week? Because I saw a couple of things that you posted. 
Um, so go ahead on and share that with the audience, man. Well, you know, we're coming to a close of the year. So a lot of we're getting a lot of deaths list and, you know, and all of that stuff earlier this week. You had the Black uh, Film Critic Circle uh, name, The Woman King, best picture, their best picture of the year, as well as Gina Prince of Iwood, its best director. Brendan Fraser, you know, was voted best actor and Danielle Deadweiler. Brendan Fraser for The Whale, Danielle Deadweiler for Till was named best actress. Nice. And then more, yeah, and then more recently you had uh, the Academy announced their shortlist in uh, 10 different categories. And so you've got a number of films out there in the song category. You had the song from Rihanna that's in Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. You've got a song from Jasmine Sullivan that's in Till. And you've got a song from The Weeknd that's in Avatar, The Way of Water. You know, so you, you've got some people that hopefully may get nominated. You know, okay. and so there's a number of things out there. So it's, you know, people are still, you know, we have a two week break, in which hopefully, you know, there's a media blackout. But people who are still trying to get that nomination or will be working every day. I got you, man. And so that's pretty interesting. So uh, you, you skirted over the, the, the Black Film Critics Circle. Um, so in all transparency, you are the, the head of this. Am I correct? Or the founder? Well, I'm one of the co-presidents. Me and someone else. Uh, is that Mr. Sargent? Yes, Mike Sargent. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a mystery. Mike Sargent's been on this show. He's a film critic, man. This is what we yeah. do. So you and Mike Sargent. And um, I wanted, I also wanted to share with you that um, I'm on the committee. I'm not on the committee. I'm one of the voters. Um, but I did not participate this year, unfortunately. Uh, and... Another person wanted me to, sh to send you a message. Shereen Nicole said she didn't receive a ballot either. So all of the D.C.-based people were all ballotless, which is why we didn't participate this year, Wilson. That's a question for Mike Sargent. That is not up to me. <laughs> I'm just, I just wanted to put it out there because I enjoy uh, supporting you. Like you support me and we support all these other organizations every year. But um, what year is this now for BFCC? I think maybe the 12th year, I guess. Congratulations, brother. You know, hey, man, you know, you you guys are doing it every year. And did you want to talk a little bit about or plug the BFCC? Well, no, it's just, so, you know, it's like any other critic, you know, my attitude is that, like, we are, I like to say, like, every other critic organization, but it's just all comprised of Black members. And, you know, it's not necessarily voting uh, what is the best in Black cinema. You know, you have other groups that do that, but more is what is the best in summer coming from Black film critics? And if we say Brendan Fraser is the best actor, knowing you have Jonathan Majors out there for Devotion, knowing you have Jeremy Pope for The Inspection, or even Will Smith for em um, Emancipation, that says a lot when collectively we're saying, and our votes collectively say, hey, Brendan Fraser was better than all three of these. Hey, Brendan Fraser was great, man. I mean, you know, he was my guy. I saw that film in Toronto and thought that it was the best performance I've seen this year when I reviewed it uh, for WETA down here on television. I told him, you're going to hear his name a lot during award season, and I stand by that. So, well, congratulations, Wilson. I just wanted to make sure that uh, the public knows, man, you know, that I think I do this show every week, man, and I invite different people on it. Man, my, my, my friend circle or my critic circle is extraordinary, man. So mm -hmm. you know, I'm proud of, of the work that Wilson, I always talk, and I'm, I'm saying this now to the audience while Wilson is listening. I often talk about uh, for what Wilson does. Wilson does an amazing job. To me, he's one of the most respected people in this space. Bro. And uh, um, it's a privilege for us to have him on here with us whenever we can actually get him. Of course, Charles, you know, Wilson and I are all members of the, of the Critics' Choice Association or back in the day, the Broadcast Film Critics Association. So, um, which Wilson technically used to mean something <laughs> when we first joined it. Right now, it's 600 members strong. I'm like, hmm. <laughs> so, I defer you for that quote, not me. What? <laughs> I'm just, I, look, I keep it, I, look, look, I'm I'm courageous in my stance, but I am proud of the memberships and the affiliations and associations that we're in, man. So um, Charles Kirkland just sent me a text and told me he's having computer issues. 
Um, so without any further ado, man, I want to get into this, Wilson. Now, do you, do you want me to go first or do you want to go first? I can go first. That we, you know, we can get this thing done. Um, in terms of <laughs> in terms of what I consider it's holiday season, boy. This is a time where we're like trying to wrap things up and go back to being lazy. So that being said, one of the films that I was disappointed in this year was Thor Love and Thunder. Wow. Now that's not surprising. So what was surprising about Thor Love and Thunder? Because when I did when we looked at this whole idea, it was about What's the thing that would keep people away? But I understand, and I want to hear you elaborate a little bit. What was disappointing about Thor Love and Thunder? You know, Marvel, you know, has a way, you know, of, you know, Taiki Watiki, or I'm butchering his name, Taika, uh, Taika Watiti, uh, the director, you know, well, you know what you're kind of getting from him. And uh, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And, you know, a lot of the, I think the best word to describe his direction is tongue in cheek. And, you know, what they've done with Chris Hemsworth and the characters, I think with this particular film was a little bit too much. Too much were like too much jokey, jokey to the point where like, are we getting any action? Are we getting any sense of storyline that's going to be serious? You know, I thought it was more of a parody than, a, than you know, than a, and, you know, and they've done four of these movies with Chris Hemsworth. You know, he's like their go-to guy. And I don't, I didn't, I don't pay, I didn't pay attention to the box office, whether or not he will get a fifth one, you know, but I'm like, come on, dude, what did he do to Thor? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you weren't feeling Thor, Love and Thunder, so that was a disappointment. That was a movie, um, I'm not going to say, when I, I thought the first two Thors, were disappointing to me. I wasn't a big fan of either the first two. I loved the third one, um, but I think the fourth one did was mixed along critics. So disappointing is actually a very apt way to describe it, Wilson. So what was the next disappointing, most disappointing film of the year for you? Um, 3,000 Years of Longing with Idris Elba, directed by George Miller. It's on and my list, too. And, and this is co-starring... Tilda Swinton. Yes, and sir. I looked at that commercial and I immediately said, what the hell? You know, and sometimes actors get pitched the project by with, you know, name so-and-so. And, you know, it depends, you know, what they're looking for. Like, hey, George Miller, well-respected guy, gave us Mad Max, gave us, you know, the last Mad Max, which got won a number of Oscars in the technical category. So, like, he's like 70 plus years old. And with Edris Elba, I don't know if he's found his footing yet. You know, he's a name, but he's not necessarily a sell. You know, but he is a sell to some people. And you figure him and Tilda Swinton, hey, listen, she built her career on doing better in some of the most weirdest films. Um, and that's her thing. So you know what you're going to get out of Tilda. But with this movie, you're like... What the hell am I wasting my time being in here? You know, so when I said I'm disappointed, it's more or less because of the talent involved. And it's not so much the talent, it's the script. And that was wrong with this movie. Okay, bro, look, I mean, and it's so funny because as you heard me say, it made my list. So that's one down less for me, man. So we are we are on the same page on that one, man. So uh, what else is was disappointing to you? Uh, there's a movie that came out on Netflix called Spiderhead. Another, <laughs> That's on another, my list too. <laughs> another Chris Hemsworth movie, Journey Smollett. I'm like, okay, you know, Chris is doing something Netflix, Journey Smollett. Oh, you know, coming off of Lovecraft Country. You look at this movie and you're like, ah, what is happening here? You have a storyline that just... Okay, let's see where it goes in the beginning. You know, in the beginning, when you watch a movie, you're giving it a chance. You know, uh, the beginning could be a little bit of a hodgepodge of like, okay, let's see if it corrects itself. And it never did. You know, um, we could spend hours talking about the plot. This is on the web. Folks can go on Wikipedia and look for it up. <laughs> but this is a movie that's just like, you know, Chris Hemsworth, I guess, you know, when you think about it, 
he sells when he does action films. Right. When he does non dramatic, non action films, it's a chore, you know, because it's like, I guess that's not what we're used to seeing him in. He's trying, and I give him credit for that. He's got to try a little bit better. Um, again, Wilson, you got to get out of my head, man. So somebody who just put a list together, your, your list has some of the same stuff mine has on it. All right. So, so what's next, Wilson? Well, you don't have a list or we're doing all me and then you? No, we are doing all you. I told you we wanted to go first. Oh, so you thought we were going to go back and forth. No, yeah, no, yeah. I wanted to get, I mean, all so right. in all actuality, what have you done now? Is that five or four? Uh, I think that's three so far. Three. No, you've done you've done several so far. Do you have it written down what you just went through? Yes, yeah, so it's Fight Ahead, Eleven Thunder, Three Thousand Years of Longer. That's three. You've only done three. I thought you did Thor. Thor, Eleven Thunder is one. Spider Ahead is two. Three Thousand Years of Longing is three. That's the only three you've done. Okay, so far. Man, that was pretty good. All well, right, well, let me let me do three. Let me do three because I'll catch you. All right, I'm going to start off uh, with a movie that was released very early in the year. And it's kind of, I hate to say it this way, but it may have set the tone. Uh, and that movie, of course, was The 355. Uh, the 355 was uh, a film, an action film that starred Jessica Chastain, um, Lupita Nyong'o, uh who am i leaving out hold on a second uh i got it here jessica chastain diane kruger fan bing bing penelope cruz and lapita nyungo um I, <laughs> all i can say is this is a movie that featured several a-list stars or several stars that that we are very familiar with and this is going to be a running theme of what we're going to talk about throughout when we talk about either it being worse or it being disappointing is that when you take really good talent and there's a lot of money behind it, but you don't really have a, a real kind of story that's lucid and that, <laughs> that, that folks can get behind, you know, you can give us all the stars you want to, but if you have no story, you have no movie and the three fifty five. You know, I hate to say it this way, but movies that are usually January releases are January releases for a reason. And <laughs> this movie came and went. And when I when I remembered it, I had to go back through chronologically through the year, Wilson. And I was like, damn, January seems like two years ago. Because literally when this movie came out, you talked about COVID earlier on in the show, Wilson. We, people forget that when we started 2022, we were still in almost like, a, according to movie studios, like a lockdown pandemic. So there was a lot of stuff that they weren't screening and we were just streaming it at home. So that's during that period. Probably, I would say the first quarter of this year because the Batman was a movie, I think one of the few movies that we actually came out the house to watch because we had been streaming everything else. So the 355, uh, was a, was was quite a way to bring the year in. And um, the fact that I can still remember that movie two weeks before the end of the year tells you that it wasn't for a good reason that I remembered that. So the 355 is first on my list. Next up is a movie that I saw at Sundance. Uh, everybody loves Kiki Palmer, and rightfully so. But I remember Alice uh, when it played at Sundance. And I just thought Alice was ridiculous, man. I mean, now, during the pandemic, I want to say, was it last year, Wilson, or the year before last, when Antebellum came out, right? And I think right now, when we talk about these sort of stories that are made during those slavery periods, you know, there are two types of films. There's 12 Years a Slave, and then there's films like Alice and Antebellum. Um, and in both cases... They kind of take the narrative of slavery, put a little tweak to them, and the tweaks just basically don't work, right? And in this film, she's a, a slave, I think, in the 1860s who is escaping, and she escapes into onto an a, a interstate where she's almost hit by a car driven by Common, uh, only to discover that it's 1973 and they've been hiding her in the woods in a different century, sort of like a bad M. Night Shyamalan pun. The next thing you know, he brings her home. 
She basically learns how to read, does current events, and then suddenly becomes a revolutionary and goes to free everybody at the old plantation. Wilson's the look on Wilson's face says it all. Ridiculous. <laughs> so I love you, Kiki Palmer. I love Common. Both of them are Black Real Award nominees, but not for this. Alice Made My List is the, one of the worst films of 2022. And to catch Wilson with my third, you, did you do three or four? You did three? Three. And my third film is going to be The Bubble. Uh, from And, and I, I like to, to apologize in advance. I love Netflix. I love all the people over at Netflix. There are a lot of Netflix movies that made my list this year, and The Bubble is another one. Uh, this movie from Judd Apatow um, that basically looked at a group of actors and actresses stuck inside of a pandemic bubble at a hotel. I mean, it, I think part of the issue with this movie is that making a movie about the pandemic while we're in a pandemic that's supposed to be a satire and funny, it's a little much, man. It's like, Wilson, it's almost like a movie I would describe as looking into a mirror, not liking what you see, but being stuck in the mirror. That's what the bubble felt like, man. And the fact, again, that comedy is all subjective, right? There's stuff that makes me laugh that Wilson may not make you laugh and vice versa, right? I'm sure when they put the screenplay together, it was funny to somebody on, the, on Judd's team. But the fact of the matter is, is that when they made it as a movie and all of the money and all of the workers and people behind the scenes, above and below the line, I worked on this thing. I'm sorry. The bubble wasn't good. A lot of people thought it wasn't good. And it makes numerous worse lists, including my own. Wilson Morales, I'm throwing it back to you. There's three for me. What are the next films that you have? And I'll match you film for film right now. Uh, what's it next that was disappointing to you this year? Ticket to Paradise. George Clooney, Julia Roberts. You know, I'm thinking... You know, it's George Clooney, Julia Roberts, two A plus movie stars, but you got them in a movie where they're playing parents to a young girl, then getting married, but they act like they're grandparents. You know, these actors are still strong enough to have some viable, a, a good career still going. It almost felt like, you know, you need a house. I need a house. You need to pay a bill. I need to pay a bill. Let's just pick a script that we can do together. <laughs> you know, this movie should have been meant for older actors. You know, if this was theater, this would have been an older actor. They're like, okay, let me be surprised. You go walk in there because it's George Clooney and Julie Roberts because you know what they can deliver. Here, I was like, why did they do this? You know, and uh, I was disappointed because I'm like, it went nowhere. This is movies are like, these are one of those Clooney Roberts movies that you won't even watch again on Peacock. <laughs> well, you know, the irony of it is, is that that was another film that made my list. And I, I agree. I concur. Uh, the fact, and you know how painful it was watching George Clooney and Julia Roberts, who you've seen in the Ocean's Eleven films, you've seen them in other films, that again, getting back to what I said earlier, that... Good film is all about story, Wilson. So whenever you give me superstars and no story, you inevitably get films like Ticket to Paradise. You get some of those earlier bombs that were Sylvester Stallone or uh, you get, I mean, you know, it's not, it's never a good thing when you have, when you have no story and you have bad screenplays and, and, and I'll just do a tease that one of the movies we're going to review this week, I'm going to talk specifically about uh, the lack of story involved. But yeah, I agree with you on that one, man. And I will take your ticket to paradise and raise you with the live action Pinocchio. Now, before people attack me at home, there were two Pinocchios that were released this year. One was from Oscar winner Guillermo del Toro, right? So we are not talking about that Pinocchio, but I'm talking about the one that was produced by Robert Zemeckis and starred Tom Hanks. And the reason why this movie ends up on the list is that Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio, 
I think it's one of the best. I think it's the best animated film that has come out this year. And the fact that it took them 1,000 days, 1,000 shooting days, it took him 15 years to prepare to make this movie. The, the, the emotion, the storytelling, the heart and everything in it is so vastly different than Zemeckis' take with Tom Hanks. I love Tom Hanks. I think Zemeckis has made some amazing films. I just think this one is not the answer. And the fact that Del Toro's comes out like three months after theirs kind of drives the, it, dri it, it, it kind of reinforces it even more of why that live action one is terrible compared to this great version that Guillermo del Toro does. So for that reason and that reason alone, that's why that movie makes that list because it is painful to watch the Mechas' version when you see del Toro's version. So uh, welcome back, Charles. Uh, we are now, Wilson, what, four movies deep or five movies deep? Four, I guess. Four yeah. movies deep. All right, so since Charles well, is back, well, 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 before we leave Pinocchio, I, I, I'll just, I, I just want to comment that um, I'm not a big fan of all the Disney re, uh, live action remakes, and you're you're correct. The, the Zemeckis's Pinocchio pales in comparison to the Del Toro version, and so it, it also made my list. But go ahead. All right, so uh, Wilson so far has given Spiderhead, Ticket to Paradise. And it was one more movie you talked about, Wilson, that made I'd my have had Thor, Love and Thunder, 3,000 years. 3,000 years of longer. So Wilson has had four, I think, three movies on his list that made my list. Charles, let's go with you. What was on your list of worst films or most disappointing films of the year? Um, in my number 10 slot, I had Blonde, which is... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> the 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 remake the, I mean not the remake the story of Marilyn Monroe with uh, Anna De Armas well uh, De Armas in in it so uh, um, I'm a big fan of Marilyn Monroe ha always have been watched a lot of her movies and there are a couple things that I know first of all about uh, Marilyn Monroe and uh, first of all she's not even in the same comparison as far as body type. I mean, she's a very good-looking girl, but she is not Marilyn Monroe. So I, I'll leave it at that. And then there's, I mean, it was just a, such a depressing movie to watch. I mean, it, from start to finish, it was just, uh, a, it just beat you senseless in its in its grotesqueness. I think. So uh, yeah, Blonde was number ten on my list. All right, so Blonde made my list as well. Um, for all the reasons you just said, not not the fact of her body type, because any actress can portray that 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 sort of bothered me, but not as much as watching what I call torture porn. Um, it, it's almost as if they picked every negative aspect of Marilyn Monroe's life, and then over it had to be over two and a half hours. I'm assuming because I don't think yeah. it was under two yeah. and a half hours. Well, Blonde, Blonde made my list as well, so that would be five in there. And like my, yeah. Blonde is brutal to watch, man. And I watch. I'm a foreign filmmaker. You're talking about an American yeah. icon. You know, there should have been a movie that should have been directed by a woman. You know, an American woman who appreciates. You know who Marilyn Monroe was. You leave you leave it to this guy. He just gave you the worst aspects of her. All right, and Wilson, I will have you go up next. What's your next film on your list? Uh, the Sun. Wow! <laughs> really? I'm gonna hear this Laura, one. Right. Okay. Laura Dern, talk about a script that's just not good. Coming from the father, which got Anthony Hopkins to do the unthinkable and beat Chadwick Boseman for the Oscar. You walked in here thinking like, "Oh, it's the Sun. It's the follow-up. It's Hugh Jackman." Anthony Hopkins is coming back in a small capacity. But this movie was kind of predictable. The dialogue was just not good. Uh, Laura Dern has had done better. Hugh Jackman has done better. You know, it, it's been mixed responses coming out because there's people are rooting for him. But I was just like, <gasps> <laughs> how much longer? I remember being in the theater and I was like, I'm in the middle row. I cannot leave. You know, this is like, can can I put on my shades in this darkened room 
and take a nap. <laughs> wow, man. Wow. Okay. All right. I'll 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 take your son, Wilson, and my next one. Uh, and I'm going to say this one before Charles gets to it because we were there at the same time. Uh, white noise. That's all. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, 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 and there's some people out there that are watching this. You know who you are. You knew this was coming. Man, I saw this movie, Wilson, and I, we all saw it at the Middleburg Film Festival this year, and it was really the opening night film. And I turned to Travis Hobson, a colleague of ours, and like halfway through, and I went, you saw this movie. You know, you were brought up to see this movie on a junket. And he goes, yeah. And I said, what was the reaction? He said, the same reaction you have right now. Man, we got out that theater, Wilson, and I never forget, Charles might have been standing there. I asked this woman, I said, so what did you think about the movie? She said, oh, that was some white noise. Right, that was some white noise. <laughs> so white noise is, is it, pretty much is the story set in the 80s of uh, a family following an air contamination accident where they reside. And I understand that Noah Baumbach did a movie I really liked several years ago called Marriage Story. Greta Gerwig, Don Cheadle, Adam Driver, a bunch of actors I really like. But I've been saying it, I say it once, I said it a thousand times. In real estate, it's location, location, location. In filmmaking, it's story, story, story. You can give me the best actors, the biggest budget, all the music. You can give me beautiful sets. Everything can work. If you have a bad story, nine times out of 10, you will have a bad movie. So having said that, Charles Kirkland, what's up next for you, sir? Oh, wow. Um, I, I wish I, I wish I could have gotten in on the white noise, hey, because <laughs> that, that, that movie... I, 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 you are much more uh, satisfied with Noah Baumbach than I am, because I really didn't even like Marriage Story enough to say that it was that. I, I think he's just not doing it for me. Something about Baumbach and and Driver together is just not working for me. I I, I I can't wait for them to not make another movie together. That's all I'm going to say. But oh, I'm sorry. And wait a minute before you get started. When the best part of your movie, they tell us, man, you need to stick around for the end credits. Tells y'all you need to know. No, 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 no. That's not what. That's not what we were told. We were told that the best part of the movie was the end credits, <laughs> before the movie started, and they were right, and they were right. <laughs> Go ahead, Charles. Um, there was an, uh, I, uh, there was another little movie that came out. Uh, I think Netflix is, is ha had a bad year. Um, at the very early part of the year, there was a movie called The 355 that came out. Oh, yeah, we already, we've already done that one, man. Move on, already did that one? I already did 355. Okay. Did you do Firestarter? I did not. Let's hear this one. Oh, okay. Firestarter is the retelling of the, the classic uh, Stephen King story starring Drew, that starred with Drew Barrymore back in the 80s. And so they decided that they wanted to do it again. For some reason, it I mean, okay, I'll be honest. The first one, because it was the 80s, it had, I mean, a nostalgia feel to it, you know, when they were making this. But I think it was horribly miscast. Zac Efron played the father of the child who has these telekinetic powers to start fires. And, um, you know, Zac Efron is a great comedic actor. He's done a lot of good stuff as far as, you know, in, in the past, but this was just not the role for him being the father of a child who has these demonic powers. And um, I mean, I wish that the movie had set itself on fire at some point in time, because as we were going, there was no connection between the father and the daughter. There was no emotional connection between it. And, and you, at some point in time, you were rooting for everybody to die. So it was just a horrible remake of a average movie that from the 80s and it just one of those times when i i know i know we us 80s um uh children are ruling the world but this was one that they just need to leave alone let's just leave it in the past and move on and and, and if 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 i get to it there's a couple other movies on the list from that horror genre that were remade in it's just it just leave stuff alone. After a certain point in time, it's just not any good to even go back. And Firestarter was one of those cases. And and I forget the girl's name. She wasn't even really memorable. 
uh, as Drew Barrymore was kind of cute, but this girl was not. So I, I'm, nice. I'm just I'm hating on Firestarter. Firestarter didn't didn't work for you, Wilson. How many more films you got on your list, man? Um, one, two, three, three. All right. So what's the next one up? Movie called uh, "Don't Worry, Darling." <laughs> oh. <laughs> Not on my list, but I heard somebody else talk about it. I didn't finish seeing the whole thing, but go ahead. This movie is directed by Olivia Wilde, in which Florence Pugh plays the wife to Harry Styles in this perfect utopia setting, only to realize that she's probably in a different world that she did not imagine. And when you're watching this movie, you're thinking, okay, Let's see where it goes. If you know we're cinephiles, it's almost like watching Logan's run, trying to for, waiting for her to figure shit out, waiting for her to figure things out. The further it went along, the more discombobulated the story got. And uh, I read, you know, how they, you know, they did a lot of editing on this movie, and uh, Kiki Lane is in the movie, and she herself has talked about how her scenes were savagely cut. Who knows uh, how much it would have added to the storyline. But by the time that movie ended, you had no idea what was going on. Now, Olivia Wilde, there were some stories prior to the movie coming out, you know, um, that may have affected its outcome. But nevertheless, the story is a story. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And when you have a storyline that, just doesn't connect. It feels like the, the word I want to say is incomplete. You know, you're jumping from one scene to the other without an explanation. So it's one of those, you know, when you walk out the movie and you're like, what can I watch? I have a tendency to come home and say to myself, I'm going to watch my top five guilty pleasure films <laughs> to get the stench <laughs> out of that watching that film. Be like, okay, <laughs> I want to go to sleep on a good note. <laughs> so don't worry, darling, is one of them. Wow. All right, Wilson, I'll take your Don't Worry Darling and raise you with the film that was set in the 1930s and follows three friends who witness a murder, become suspects themselves, and uncover one of the most outrageous plots in American history. The reason why this film is bad is because this is the same guy that did Three Kings. This is the same guy uh, who did... Please let me let me just double check because I want to make sure I'm 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 saying this correctly because this film wasn't the answer. Um, but you know who I'm talking about if you know Three Kings, right? David O. Russell, who yes. did American Hustle. I mean, David O. Russell has done some amazing films, and then came Amsterdam. <laughs> I was going to Amsterdam. save that for last, but yes, that is one of those. Amsterdam. Uh, David John David Washington. Margot Robbie. I mean, you got some stars in here in this in this really ball uh, film that feels like when you're watching it, you keep waiting for it to do something, and the something that it does is not just strange and odd, but it doesn't elevate the film at all. Um, and I, I remember sitting at a screening watching this and, you know, Wilson doesn't live down here, but Jim Judy and I spent the whole film doing like this, looking at each other like, I would turn to him and go, <laughs> and he would go <laughs> back to me. I was like, I don't know, what the, what are we watching with Amsterdam? David O. Russell, I mean, again, we talked about Noah Baumbach earlier. We talked about David O. Russell. There's, there are several directors on here. You talked about uh, when you did Thor, uh, Love and Thunder. Uh, I can't pronounce his name, and I'm not going to. Michael Waititi. Yeah, I mean, there's some directors that that made some choices this year that simply didn't work in these movies. And, then we, and, and that's been a running theme along with the lack of story. For an hour, Amsterdam took one away from Wilson. Wilson took three away from me. Charles took one away from me. I took some away from him. Charles, what do you have next? Well, I'll, I'm going to get this one in before somebody else says it, but I, I want to say Morbius. If, if if there was a film, I mean, you want to talk superheroes. Superhero movies are pretty good, pretty popular. A lot of people watch them. 
Um, so this was a Sony movie that came out um, with, starring Jared Leto, who we saw as the Joker. And I, I mean, you know, we, we were kind of excited because this isn't like supposed to be the launch of the the dark side of Sony, the, the Spider-Man universe. And, you know, Venom wasn't great, but it was passable. Morbius, however, which was the story of, of a, a, a vampire who kind of a superhero, anti-hero. But it was, I mean, this is just a horrible film. It poorly shot. I mean, you couldn't, there were a lot of times when you're looking at things and you don't know what you're looking at because it was so dark. It was hard to see. The story made no sense. Jared Leto, as, as great as a, uh, an actor he is, there was no way he was elevating this terrible plot to to anything that was respectable. I I, I was just so this is one of when we talk about disappointing films. This was a film that I had high hopes for that things were going to go well in the Sony uh, Spider Man universe, and it just torpedoed all all my expectations in in this film. And so I, I for. For that reason and that reason alone, you, they they let me down, and this movie was horrible. And so Morbius makes my top ten of worst movies of 2022. All right. So first of all, let me just do a correction. You said, and I quote, that Venom was passable. I didn't like Venom either. I, I think they've done a horrible job with both these films, and I absolutely concur and agree. The only reason why I didn't put Morbius on my list is because I had 10 other stinkers that I thought were better than that. Or, or, or should I say, more disappointing or worse than that. Uh -huh. Wilson, please, because we're ready to wrap this up. Charles, we're going to go honorable mention because a lot of the films that you probably have on your list are some of the movies that we have already. Wilson, what do you have left? Uh, a movie, and I throw it in there, even though I don't think a lot of people saw it, called Stars at Noon, starring Margaret Qualley, uh, Annie McDowell's daughter and uh, Joe Olin, I believe his name is. And it's a movie I saw at a festival, came out later in theaters about an American who is in a foreign country and she acts as a semi prostitute to make money to find her way to get out. Then she meets this guy and she latches onto him as far as her, I always call it a savior, but. This storyline, and you know, and half the movie, she's half naked. It's like, why does she sign up to this? Sometimes actors, sometimes actors take on a role if they're the lead, if they're if no one's giving them that sort of spotlight, you know, to lead where they're more in the pages on the script. Mm -hmm. But this was not going anywhere. And then you know, when you want, you know, granted, sometimes when you're at a festival, you know, you want to see things that may pique your interest. And this piqued my interest because I said, okay, I wanted to see where it goes. I forgot the name of it. Oh, Claire Denis directed it. Yeah. By her name alone, you say, okay, Claire Denis, she's done a lot more reputable films that merits worth seeing. So you walk in there, you see it, and you're like, somewhere along the line, was this a Czech movie or like what happened? <laughs> you know? Uh, but it's the least of the movies that I mentioned because it's a movie that that is little seen that doesn't have the big names. You know, every other film between Amsterdam, you know, you you, you go back and you're like, okay, Kristen and Margot and John David. And I'm sorry for, I'm, I feel sorry for John David because he's trying to give him these big roles and he's just not delivering because the, the film is not delivering. You know, he did a movie last year, I think that was on Netflix. Uh, where he was like a, a, an ambassador and a somewhat a Beirut was it called? I'm not sure. Um, yeah, he, you know he's just he, you know he's trying. You know you think about you know these are big names in the movies. That's why when they say worse is because we're going in there, we're being lured in there because of the talent, and we're not getting our deliverables. Damn, well that's pretty harsh. <laughs> Go ahead. So, so Charles, just read me what what you have on the rest of your list, man. Well, I had um, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Me Time, the Kevin Hart film, Kevin Hart and, and Mark Wahlberg, um, Black Light, which was um, uh, what's Dark Man's name? You know, uh, 
I will find you. Whatever. You know the guy. He does all the same roles. Every film, he's the, the, the vengeance guy coming after people. But Liam Neeson. You're talking about Liam Neeson? Yeah. Yeah, Liam Neeson. And uh, the last thing I don't think we've all talked about is Moonfall, which was uh, that that horrible thing with Halle Berry, the woman that I love. I forgot and, to talk about that. Yeah. yeah. Huh? I forgot about Moonfall. Oh, we forgot about Moonfall. Yeah, well, see, I, that's why I'm here, to remind you. What's I'm saying? It all depends on what people want to see. You know, when you're in a position where you can watch stuff at home, you're like, I ain't going to theaters to see that. I'm good. Send me the link. Damn, Moon. I mean, how did how did Moonfall get to the last pick and nobody hit that one? Wow. Wow, Mr. Irrelevant Moonfall. I I pulled it out of out of out of my back pocket. Well, that's a good choice. All right, well, we got a couple of things to review, and I think Wilson I know has seen both of these. Charles has not, so this is just me and Wilson talking. Charles, you just stand here and listen. This is going to be a lot of fun. First up on our reviews this week is Whitney Houston, I Want to Dance with Somebody, which is a musical film based on the life and career of Whitney Houston, directed by Casey Lemons, Eves by You, Black Nativity, Harriet, uh, from a screenplay from Anthony McCartan, who did, who wrote screenplays for The Two Popes. Um, you know, this film stars Naomi Ackie as Houston, Stanley Tucci, Ashton Sanders, Tamara, Tamara Tooney, Nafisa Williams from Black Lightning, and Clark Peters. Um, Wilson, I'm going to go first because, you know, you are a nice guy. And nice is not what this, this review needs. Um, this film is probably, I don't know how many times the Whitney Houston story. I know the, the most recent one is the one that Angela Bassett did that starred Yaya DaCosta, right? Um and, and before I begin, let's also understand that Whitney Houston and I are literally 16 days apart. She was born 16 days before me, literally in the same city. And no, though we didn't meet until years later or see her until years later. So there's a personal connection to Whitney Houston. Charles has a personal connection to Whitney Houston. So the only person who doesn't have a personal connection is Wilson Morales. So having said that, I'm sitting here eagerly waiting to see what this movie is. And I'll just say it's two hours and what about two, two hours and 20 Wilson, something like that. One hundred and forty six yep. minutes. Um, the first hour of the movie literally is what I call the equivalent of speed cinema, right? We go through the first 10 years of Whitney Houston's life in a blur. There are, there are, multiple scenes, it feels like it's a, a, a series of vignettes that are these really nice scenes that all follow one another, yet never connect to each other. You just kind of watching them and it's like, if you don't kind of know the backstory or know the history, it doesn't really register for you. You're like, well, what the heck is going on? And I think it's intentional because what they want to do is to get you through all of the early parts of Whitney's life to get you to what we call the downward spiral that happens in the second hour, right? Now, the one thing that I will say that I thought they did a really good job is in recreating, having Naomi Aki and whoever did the costumes for this film, I give them a lot of credit because they literally recreated all of the signature Whitney Houston looks, whether it was in the bodyguard or, you know, and like all these music videos, all these looks that Whitney Houston had they really recreate those. Um, so having said that, the rest of this movie is a hot mess, right? I'll give you credit for the ending because I thought that you didn't want to have it end on a down note, so I like that. But there's not much to like in here. I thought the casting was off. Um, we talked about how they were, you know, if you, you could really Google and see what Whitney's parents looked like, and they weren't cast that way. You can look at people like Bobby Brown, there was one part of the movie, Wilson, where I was sitting next to two people I didn't know, and they introduced Anita Baker in the film for a hot second, and they just burst out in the laughter. Because, like, like, <laughs> like so, I, so there's a lot of problems with this movie. And the only reason why it didn't make my list is because, as I said, I thought that all the music, because it had Clive Davis as a producer, so a lot of the music was licensed and they were able to play that. And I thought Naomi Aki lip synced her way brilliantly through all those scenes. 
But outside of that, man, there's a lot of holes in this story and a lot of stuff that just doesn't make any sense. If I had to give this thing a grade, I'd give it a C minus. Um, this movie, man, it, it just worked my nerves. And I think me and several critics had a I had about a half hour kind of pick apart session at the end of this movie. Like, why wasn't this? What was it? Bruh, if you had to spend that much time dissecting a movie, it's not good. Wilson Morales, having said that, I've gotten it all out of my system. What do you think about I Want to Dance with Somebody? I felt it was incomplete. You know, I think, you know, Whitney was such a, a force that we knew a lot about her life. And even after her death, you know, we, we know a lot going on. And, you know, there have been several documentaries and films featuring or about Whitney. So I do give them credit for introducing some new material about Whitney. But the way they did it, was more like a Wikipedia page. You know, like, it starts off with such kinetic, there's no time to breathe. Like, for one minute, you, she's a little girl. Next minute, she's a singer. Next minute, she meets Clyde. No explanation whatsoever, or no follow-through. I would say no explanation. I would say no follow-through. And then, uh, granted, the reason it's two hours and 20 minutes is because you're playing a lot of Whitney's songs in its entirety. Yep. Mm -hmm. so, when it's, so it's more of a musical than a film because you're not really giving a chance to explore Whitney through, you know, scenes. Everything goes by so quick. And, you know, some of the characters, like, they did Bobby Brown badly, you know. Oh, they did a, God. <laughs> you know, like, they, I like Ashton, Ashton Sanders, but I'm like, wow. You know, so overall... The girl's okay, you know, she's like you said, she lip sync her. It's the story. And this is coming from Anthony McCartan, I think, who's been nominated for an Oscar before or whatever. And it's like, how did he come to be the guy? Wouldn't it have been easier if somebody that knew Whitney or somebody that's in that realm would have bought, you know, would have wrote the story to, because they would have had more insights to what what to add in. I granted, you know, when you do a biopic, you can't add in everything. It's better off taking a slice of their life and just focusing on that. Well, let me tell you something, man. Um, to your point, when you talked about doing Bobby Brown dirty, I'm glad you put that in there because, man, I, and, and and the thing that's interesting about it, Wilson, is that wasn't this a, wasn't this signed off on by the family? I like to think that they wanted to sanitize and preserve Whitney's legacy without going into the dark period of her life. Wow, man. Well, you know, uh, Whitney Houston, I Want to Dance with Somebody opens in theaters uh, this weekend. Um, can, can I just say this? Yes. We knew this movie was going to be bad because it wasn't submitted to us through screen. Uh, and, and, you know, the voting period has expired on a lot of things and they and they did not get this film to us. And when that, whenever that happens, they we already get an idea of what this film is going to be like. So we kind of—I don't think it, you were disappointed in that it was bad. I, I think it wasn't shocking to either one of you that this film wasn't that great. Well, having said that, man, we're going to end today's show just like they ended. I want to dance with somebody on the upbeat note. The best man, the final chapters. Uh, tells a story as relationships evolved and past grievances resurface in unpredictable stages of middle crisis meets midlife renaissance. Uh, Malcolm Lee is back with what he is calling a third and quote unquote final chapters of the best man franchise. And I'll tell you, I'll start the same way I started when I interviewed him that in thinking about it in hindsight, the, the fact that they did a, an eight-part limited series to end this franchise is friggin' brilliant, right? So you've had two movies, right? So we got to spend two hours with them when we saw The Best Man in 1999. We spent two more hours with them. I think it was in 2013 when The Best Man Holiday came out. We get six, almost seven hours of our favorite characters and to watch them grapple in good times and bad times you know, I'm just going to cut to the chase. Everybody knows you've seen the best man. If you watch this show, if you watch the movies, you know who the characters are. They bring them all back with the exception of Monica Calhoun, who who passed at the end of Best Man Holiday. 
um, as the series as the series starts. Um, I forget. I, I and and excuse me for not using Harper and all of the characters' names. I'll just say the actors. Mars Chestnut. His character is in a really dark place, man. He's lost his wife. The film, or I think the the series starts. Wilson, am I correct? Two years after the end of the Best Man Holiday. Am I about right? Something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he's in a really dark place. You know, he has become like a super womanizer because his wife isn't there and he's just kind of like drifting along. Uh, Harper, which is Tay Diggs, I know that character's name. Uh, the book that caused so many problems in The Best Man is now they've now approached him that they want to turn that, that book into a film, which again brings back old feelings for all the cast members. That he's got to go get blessings from everybody. Um, his wife, played by Sanaa Lathan, is kind of in wonderlust. And we find out a little later on in some episodes that there's going to be something that comes along and spark her interest. Um, the character, played by Nia Long, who we knew as a producer before, now has become a full blown exec. And she is, you know, doing her thing. I'm, I, I forget, was, it, was she at CNN? I don't remember. I don't remember either. But yeah, she was a big time exec. Uh, we witnessed that uh, Q, played by Terrence Howard, has fallen in love and he's engaged to uh, a, a, an influencer and a woman of money, played by Nicole Airy Parker. So that's always funny. And then Melissa D'Souza, who they have this off and on bond, is not taking that well. So there's the comedic elements. And finally, we get the merch. And uh, played by Harold Pinot. And I don't know what Regina Hall's character's name is, but they've settled into their marriage and the, the trials and tribulations they go through. So having set all that up, uh, over the course of these eight episodes, we see these different arcs. You know, to use Frankie Beverly and Mays, you get joy and you get pain. But at the end, the, the, the bond among all of them, the ladies, the men, the way Malcolm wrote it, you know, people describe it as being messy. Yeah, it is messy. But the best man is a lot of fun. And by the time I got to the end, I was smiling, Wilson. And I told Malcolm, it made me smile, man. I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was great. Um, you know, we normally do grades for this, which I wouldn't do for a limited series. But if I did, it'd be a B plus, almost like an A minus. I thought it was, I, I love the best man in the final chapters. I thought it was great. Wilson, what is your takeaway from this this uh, series? Well, I'm not going to go into this long speech like you did, you know, breaking it. Sorry, man, I had to set it up, man. I just couldn't tell you. You were just like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Wilson. My I was like, it's on TV. People can just slip around and be like, oh, it's like, there's a difference between people going to the movie theaters and spending money. I'm supposed to be on TV. Like, let me just check it out. <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, obviously it's not easy to bring back a cast 20 plus years, the whole entire cast. Right. And, uh, you know, they've had two films and, you know, circum and, the, and a cast that's currently still working, you know, so like, and whose paper money has gone up, you know, so like to do a limited series, you know, now that we've had Peacock, which is a division of Universal, which have released the first two films, you know, it's a genius thing that they did eight episodes, you know, uh, just to kind of wrap, just to kind of wrap things up and see where it's gonna go, you know, some storylines are better than others, but I'm with it. You know, it's like we've been fans of the first two films. You know, we I'm not asking for perfection. You know, it's just good seeing these characters once again. And for eight episodes, hey, you got a long time to just see how it plays out. I so I like that's it. That was that's been... all you get, Wilson. That's all you get for me. I like the film. I like the series. You know, I like it's. It's a good, you know, ending to what, you know, what started out in 1999. You know, all these guys are, you know, they're older, they're in their 50s. How much, you know, you, you, it's hard to keep writing forever, you know, uh, these characters as they get older. You know, it's like when you're watching these these movies, you know, when you get to like a part four or five, it's like, hey, you can't be great. You know, it's like as, as much as we all want them, they can't do it all forever. I agree. I was going to say, I've been oh, forbidden good. from watching this series because my wife wants to watch it. So we have to sit, I have to sit down and watch it together with her. So, uh, I mean, it, these are beloved characters. I mean, the first two movies were outstanding. I, I, and Malcolm Dingley puts 
it has, has something special and, and he must be something special to get all these people to come back and in, in for uh, this limited series and for Terrence Howard, who's now says he's retired as an actor to, to uh, come out and do it, do this last little thing for him. I, I, I think it's, it's going to be special to, for me to watch. So I, I, I'm, I'm excited to hear Tim give it a B plus a B plus a minus that cause that's, that's odd for him to rate a TV show that high. So we'll see. Man, I'm just laughing because Wilson watched me do all of that, and he was like, "Yeah, that's all I got, man. They can just turn it on, man. Flip through it. Come on, Wilson, you got you you got to be hyped behind this show. This this movie was literally made, and 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 again, I you know, please understand. First year that we started the Black Reel Awards, this movie was one of our nominees. It actually won one of our awards in its first year, and here we are now, 23 years later, and we're still we're, we're still talking about what Malcolm Lee did he had spike lee produce the first one i mean there is a lot to like about these characters and the fact you you know both of you guys have echoed this that he was able to bring back the original cast man um in order to do this and the original cast now and has grown in stature over 20 years you're talking about nia long sanaa lathan uh tay diggs you know harold bono who's working all over the place it wasn't easy man and the fact, like I said, I enjoyed the fact that they were able to stretch the story out. Um, Wilson said some of the some of the uh, some of the arcs work better than others. I would agree with that. But I think at the end of the day, I always love that the bond that these these gentlemen had with each other. Whether it's can you stand the rain and the best man holiday, the the moments that they share together in the original best man back in 1999. I just love the story, man. And you know, one of the questions I asked Malcolm was like, hey, man, if you think about five years from now, there's something else that happens. Like, maybe they got some kids, the next generation. Is there anything we can do to bring some of these actors back? And he was like, I never say never, but I think this is the last ride, man, with these guys. So if it is, you know, you'll ride away with a smile on your face, unlike Wilson, who's like, yeah, you know, it was good, man. Just check it out. <laughs> In all honesty, a little bit under the weather, so I'm not that, I don't have that much time. All right, man. Well, that wraps it up for us today. Uh, I want to I wanna thank Charles Kirkland, who stuck with it, despite whatever challenges he had over there, who was in and out. Wilson Morales, who uh, was trying to, to, to get out before the blizzard that's coming, because it's all going to hit us all in the Northeast this week, and we're all going to have freezing temperatures and snow and rain. But I just, on the, on, from the bottom of my heart, I want to say happy holidays, Merry Christmas to all of you guys. Wilson, are you staying local or are you going to be traveling for the holidays? I'm, I'm very local. And Charles, what about you? I'm staying right here, hunkering down. All right, and I'm doing the same thing, man. So whatever you do, man, enjoy your holiday, man. Uh, we'll come back next week with the best films of the year. Wilson will definitely be back for that one because he had, you still got films to put on your list, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm in the same place, man. Um, still working on my list. Charles, I'm assuming you're in the same place. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll be back next week to, to celebrate films. The day was about, mm -mm, that film didn't work. <laughs> and you know who you are. <laughs> so as we tell you guys every week, man, please see something good at the movies. Uh, we told you what not to see, and you heard our reviews. You check those out. You guys have a happy holiday. Have a Merry Christmas. If you're out there and you don't celebrate Christmas, Kwanzaa, Hanukkah, you do whatever you do on December 25th. You guys enjoy. You guys take care and have a happy holiday. Good night. Take care, folks.